Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on the lymphoma from the 2021 American Society of Hematology Annual Meeting. I am Jimena, and I will be the operator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker, and you will have the opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow the link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you are listening by the phone, the link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. Now I am pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of the Patient Education Program at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you, and thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us in today's update on lymphoma from the 2021 American Society of Hematology Annual Meeting. We'd like to thank our sponsors of this webinar, Bristol Myers Squibb, Foundation Medicine, Kite Pharma, and Genentech. Before I turn the program over to our speakers, I wanna briefly share information with you on LRF. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we're thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. The Lymphoma Research Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment specific resources, programs, and services all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma-specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link or via LRF's website at lymphoma.org if you're on your phone. The LRF Help Guide can answer your specific questions about lymphoma, as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. We offer a variety of publications that have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure you have access to the latest lymphoma information. Our mobile app, Focus on Lymphoma, is an award-winning app that provides patients and caregivers access to comprehensive content as well as unique tools to help manage your disease. Finally, we've launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through this challenging time. Please visit our Learning Center for access to webinars, articles, and other resources specific to COVID-19. I really hope you all take advantage of some of the great resources and services that LRF provides. If you have questions regarding what you heard about today, or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to LRF through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today with two expert speakers, and I'm honored to first introduce you to Dr. Brad Call. Dr. Call is a hematologist and oncologist at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, where he is the director of lymphoma program. He's also a member of our scientific advisory board. He is a professor of medical oncology in the Department of Medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Call, for speaking at our program today. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Well, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to uh, give a, a brief ASH update in lymphoma today. Um, it's always, you know, a challenge putting these sorts of programs together. I know we have a large audience and a diverse audience, and and everyone has, you know, the lymphomas that are of most interest to them. And as people know, there's like a hundred different kinds. So, um, <clears throat> what I tried to do was pick what I thought were the most impactful presentations in lymphoma this year. And this year, it ended up being um, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So I have a few abstracts I'm going to talk about in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And then I found a few, that a couple that I thought were pretty important in follicular lymphoma. I honestly didn't think um, there was anything, you know, immediately practice changing in mantle cell lymphoma this year or marginal zone lymphoma or T-cell lymphoma or Hodgkin lymphoma. So I don't have any updates there that are in my slides. But of course, if people have questions on those entities, we're very happy to address those in the Q&A portion. 
Um, so I'll try to go through the slides pretty quickly to leave plenty of time for question and answers. So here are my disclosures. So um, these are the things that were most noteworthy to me um, at the 2021 American Society of Hematology meeting. We saw some data that suggests we may get a new frontline standard of care in diffuse RGB cell lymphoma, which is the most common lymphoma that we see. And we saw a couple of presentations suggesting that there will be a new standard of care for high-risk relapsed diffuse RGB cell lymphoma. And then in follicular lymphoma, I think we're getting more data on um, what a, a drug class of drugs called bispecific monoclonal antibodies. So I wanted to highlight one of those abstracts. And then we're seeing some data on CAR T cell therapy in follicular lymphoma, which is a really interesting option for follicular lymphoma with a challenging risk benefit profile, trying to figure out which follicular lymphoma patients might be appropriate for CAR T cell therapy. And we did get a little bit of a um, couple of updates with longer term follow up. So I wanted to show those because I think that's important. <clears throat> so here's the study that I think could change the standard of care. Um, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma frontline. Um, so our standard treatment for about 20 years now has been this regimen called R-CHOP. Prior to that, it was just plain old CHOP. And then rituximab came along and improved outcomes. And then there have been a lot of attempts to improve on R-CHOP in the last 20 years, all of which have failed to, to do so. Um, but there was a new trial that was um, just conducted and read out. And this new trial incorporates a novel drug called polituzumab vidotin, and this is an, an antibody drug conjugate, and I'll try to explain that a little better. Um, and um, antibody drug conjugates are basically agents where a very potent cytotoxic drug, like a potent chemotherapy agent, is attached to a monoclonal antibody, and then you use the monoclonal antibody to selectively deliver this drug to the tumor cells, which should spare normal healthy cells of the toxicity. And it's a way to try to deliver more potent um, chemotherapeutic agents, things that you couldn't just administer intravenously. So this is what an antibody drug conjugate looks like. Um, the, it's kind of a Y-shaped protein, and um, that's the monoclonal antibody. And then the little purple things hanging off that are, this, are, are where you attach the cytotoxic drug. And um, in the slide are, are listed some of the agents that are commonly used in antibody drug conjugates. Um, so this, this drug MMAE is the cytotoxic agent that's used in polituzumab vidotin. There are other drugs listed here that are components of other uh, antibody drug conjugates. So this is how an antibody drug conjugate works. So if you look at the cartoon, you see the antibody drug conjugate at the top binding to a receptor that's hopefully specific to the cancer cells or relatively specific to the cancer cells and not present on normal healthy tissues. And so when the antibody binds this um, antigen, it's internalized inside the cell, which is shown in, this, in the circle there. Um, and then um, the drug is released from the antibody, and then the drug can go do what it is supposed to do inside the cell, and the, it can either cause DNA disruption if it's a DNA damaging agent, or it can um, cause what's known as microtubule disruption if it's a microtubule inhibiting agent, which are the most common types of um, drugs that are used in uh, antibody drug conjugates. So um, this, was the, this was the study that was presented um, at the meeting. This was a global phase three randomized clinical trial that it was placebo controlled and double blinded. So for example, we had this trial open at our center and I would not know which patients were getting the polituzumab vidotin and which patients were not. Um, and the idea here was to um, take polituzumab vidotin and add it to the regimen and, and replace one of the old drugs in the RCHOP regimen, and the drug it replaced was a drug called vincristine. 
And vincristine is an old chemotherapeutic uh, agent, um, and we've long thought it's probably the least valuable drug in the regimen. And so that was the drug that made the most sense to try to replace. And so half the patients had the vincristine subtracted and polituzumab added, and half the patients received standard RCHOP with the vincristine. And they would receive it for six cycles. And the patient population was um, newly diagnosed, untreated, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. There's a few nuances to the patient population that I, I won't get into here, but we can talk about later. So just kind of cutting to the bottom line, if you look at the response rates. So for the polituzumab vidotin in our CHIP uh, patients, there are 440 of those. The complete response rate was 86.6% which looks a little better than what you saw with our CHOP at 82.7%. So there's a little bit of hope that more patients are getting into complete remission. And then these are the Kaplan-Meier curves from the study. And the green curve, if you look at the left, the green curve on the top is the progression-free survival for the Pola R chip. And you can see it's a little bit better than our CHOP. And if you look at the very bottom of the slide, the two, the 24-month progression-free survival is 76.7% for polituzumab vidotin our chip versus 70.2% for our chop. So that tells you at two years the proportion of patients who are alive and still in remission. And so it's not um, a huge um, difference between those two, but it is a difference. 76.7% is better than 70.2%. And importantly, there were really no differences between the two regimens in terms of side effects and toxicities. So you're getting this improvement without additional toxicity. So, um, so the conclusions were um, that this R-chip POLA, as we call it, um, does seem to represent an improvement over standard R-CHOP chemotherapy with similar um, toxicities. And um, I think those of us who treat lymphoma patients are expecting this RCHIP POLA regimen to get um, FDA approval, <clears throat> and then it would be available to offer to our patients with newly diagnosed diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the um, next two abstracts in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And um, so when patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma relapse, which happens to about a third of patients, one of the things that can be offered is um, what's called autologous stem cell transplantation. And that approach can cure some patients, not all, but some. And so that's been our standard for a long time. Now, to, for patients to um, be candidates for autologous stem cell transplant, which is a pretty uh, difficult procedure to go through, they have to be relatively young, relatively healthy, most centers have an age cutoff around age 70 for this kind of approach. But we've known for a long time that for many patients, the stem cell transplant doesn't perform very well, particularly patients who get standard therapy and relapse quickly. So, for example, uh, if we have a patient who gets um, RCHOP chemotherapy in the front line and then they either don't fail, either they don't get into remission at all, or they go into remission but relapse within a few months. That's always a bad scenario. It suggests the patient has fairly chemotherapy resistant disease. And when we take patients like that down the auto stem cell pathway, we probably only cure about two out of 10. So really, unsatisfying results. And we've, we've known for a few years now the potential of um, so-called CAR T-cell therapy, which is now FDA approved for recurrent diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but it's for patients who have failed two lines of therapy. For example, they failed R-CHOP and a stem cell transplant, or they failed R-CHOP and another line of chemotherapy. And what this trial called Zuma 7 wanted to ask was, um, gee, does it make sense to force patients to fail two lines of therapy if they're these high-risk patients 
wouldn't maybe the patients be better off if they relapse quickly after our chop if we just go straight to the CAR T cell therapy and not do the stem cell transplant? And that's really what this next these next two trials tried to address. So um, for people who on the call who don't know, CAR T cell treatment is where we um, take T cells out of the patient. We take them out of the patient with the lymphoma. Um, through a paresis procedure, and then the T cells are genetically manipulated to recognize the patient's B cells because the lymphoma is derived from B cells. So we're basically taking their T cells out, tricking them to recognize the B cells, and then those B T cells are infused back into the patient. So this manufacturing process takes three to four weeks, and then when we get the cells back, from the company, we can infuse them into the patient, and then you basically let the T cells go fight the cancer. And that is a strategy that looks like it can cure maybe 30 to 40% of patients with relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And so that's a pretty good outcome, and those, these were patients who really had no chance of cure before. So the question this study Zuma 7 was asking what if we compared the CAR T cell strategy directly against the stem cell transplant procedure? And so it took these patients with high risk relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma and randomized them to the CAR T product. In this case, the product was called the AXI cell versus standard of care, that's the SOC, which is the stem cell transplant, which is what we normally offer patients. So this just shows you the bookkeeping right here. 180 patients are assigned to AXI cell and 179 were assigned to standard of care. And then it tells you how many got the leukapheresis for the T cells and how many got their salvage chemotherapy. And look at the bottom in the orange boxes of 168 patients who received salvage chemotherapy. Only 80 responded to the salvage chemotherapy, which just shows you how generally chemotherapy resistant these patients tend to be. And that's, a, that's where we knew our big problem was with the standard of care approach. And so at the end of the day, only 64 of those patients eventually moved forward to the high-dose therapy autologous stem cell transplantation, whereas 170 of the 180 patients were able to get the AXI cell product. And this just kind of shows the bottom line results. Again, it's, this is another Kaplan-Meier curve looking at event-free survival and the red curve is the standard of care autologous stem cell transplant approach. And you can see at 24 months, only 16% of the patients are event free, meaning that they have received their therapy, didn't need any other therapy and are in remission. So it, it produced the kind of result that we were afraid it would. Um, but the question was, would CAR T be any better in this high risk patient population? And lo and behold, it was better at two years, 40% of the patients are still in their um, in in remission and haven't needed any other therapy. So that's a big improvement in outcome. So um, the conclusions was that this Axi cell product um, looks to be much more effective in these high risk relapse refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients, and um, I think we are expecting Axi cell to get a second line indication from the FDA that will allow us to offer this to patients who have these uh, relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma with high risk features. So this is a big advance, a big breakthrough in the management of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Now there was another trial which basically showed the same thing. So I'm gonna go through this more quickly. This is a different CAR T cell product called Lysacel made by a different company. And the trial design was really pretty much identical to what I just showed you. These are high-risk relapse patients who relapse within one year of our CHOP chemotherapy, and they're randomized to the CAR-T product Lysacel or standard of care. And we saw results from this TRANSFORM study that look very similar to the Zuma 7 trial I just showed you. There's fewer patients on this trial, and the follow-up is shorter, but I'll draw your attention to um, like the 10 month mark, you can see um, with the dotted lines, um, almost half the lysosel patients are still in remission versus only about 25% of the lysosel patients. And when you get out to like 18 months, those numbers are getting a bit lower, but 
it looks like these curves are going to look very similar to what I just showed you in Zuma 7, where we may have a good outcome for about 40% of the CAR T-cell patients and only about 20% of the standard care patients. So it's kind of reassuring to see um, transform get the same results uh, with lysocell as we saw with axicell, and I think we're expecting lysocell to also get a second line indication. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to finish up talking about follicular lymphoma for a couple of minutes, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Stevens to talk about CLL, and then we'll open it up for questions and be happy to talk about other lymphomas. So this is a promising strategy for relapse follicular lymphoma. The drug is called mosinituzumab, and it's a class of drug called a bispecific monoclonal antibody. Um, and I think on the next slide, I've got a cartoon showing how these drugs work. So <clears throat> you can see in the cartoon, there's a target tumor cell at the bottom, and then there's a healthy T cell at the top. And then you see this drug coming in, this monoclonal antibody. In this case, it's mosinituzumab. And one arm of the antibody will stick to um, the tumor cell by sticking to CD20. And another arm of the antibody in green there will stick to um, a receptor on the T cell called CD3. And this is called a bispecific monoclonal antibody because it actually will bind both B cells and T cells. And that will pull these cells in proximity to one, to one another to try to get the T cells to kill the B cells. So that's the idea behind a bispecific monoclonal antibody. So this isn't something that you have to manufacture special in a patient. You can literally pull this drug off the shelf and administer to a patient immediately, which has some advantages. So how good is the drug? So this is a study in relapse follicular lymphoma. So these are patients who have had follicular lymphoma who have been through standard type treatments and now have relapse disease and need other options. And so the mosinituzumab, it's a bit of a, all these bispecifics have um, some issues with a side effect called cytokine release syndrome. And so a big part of the study was trying to figure out the optimal dosing strategy to try to minimize the risk of cytokine release syndrome. When patients get cytokine release syndrome, they get high fevers and they feel very flu-like. They feel awful for a period of time, maybe hours or a couple of days. So we definitely want to minimize the cytokine release syndrome in patients. They can even get low blood pressure and rarely have to go to the intensive care unit for blood pressure support. So this is a this is a side effect that we want to minimize. So the way the mosinituzumab was given in this study is on day one, the patients received a baby dose of one milligram. And then a week later, they receive a baby dose of two milligrams and then on day 15, they receive a full dose of 60 milligrams. And then they come back a week later to do the 60 milligrams again. And then the dose drops to 30 milligrams. And then that dose is given every three weeks as an outpatient. So the treatment is all given as an outpatient. And then patients only need to be hospitalized if they get bad cytokine release syndrome. So how well did the drug work? Um, so the table is a little confusing. Um, IRF means... Um, independent review committee and investigator means what the local investigator judged, but the results are the same. The complete response rate was 54% for mosinituzumab and relapse follicular lymphoma, and the overall response rate came in at 70 to 72%. So I think that's a pretty darn good outcome for um, a single agent in relapse follicular lymphoma. These patients have had multiple prior therapies and maybe have um, not a ton of options available. And this is called a waterfall plot that tells you the degree of lymph node shrinkage. And bars that are pointing downward is good. That means the lymph nodes are getting smaller. And if the bars are pointing upward, that's bad. That means the lymph nodes are getting larger. And you can see the vast, and each bar represents an individual patient. So the vast, vast majority of the bars are pointing downward, showing you know the vast majority of patients benefited from this experimental drug. This is the progression-free survival curve, which shows you the proportion of patients still in remission after getting the drug. So the follow-up is still on the short side, but you can see at 18 months, 
about half of the patients are still in remission. So that's, I'd say that's a pretty good result. I wouldn't call it a great result. We'd like more patients to still be in remission at 18 months. Um, but, you know, it'll be really interesting and important to see longer follow-up for this drug in follicular lymphoma. And hopefully there'll be a proportion of patients who get nice, long, durable remissions from this drug. Here's the data on the cytokine release syndrome. And on the bar graphs on the right, we can see um, how many people got it with the one milligram dose. It's about 20%. And then when they go up to the 60 milligram dose, the cytokine release syndrome jumps up to 36%. Fortunately, most of it is mild, grade one or grade two, which isn't severe. And there were very few um, instances of grade three or four cytokine release syndrome, although it can happen and it's something that has to be monitored uh, in patients. Um, the cytokine release syndrome can be managed with steroids and with a special drug called tocilizumab, and those agents are very effective at controlling the symptoms from the cytokine release syndrome. So I think this bispecific monoclonal antibody, mosinituzumab, looks really promising um, in relapsed follicular lymphoma. Um, I am hopeful that it gets FDA approval um, in the near future because we would love to have this option to offer to our patients routinely. Right now, we can only offer it as part of uh, ongoing clinical trials. But I think this is one of the more promising drugs I've seen in a few years in follicular lymphoma. <clears throat> and then I'll just finish up. So I talked about CAR T cell therapy and it's FDA approved for use in relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And then this, this product, AxiCell, actually has an FDA approval in relapsed follicular lymphoma. Um, but when it was approved, the follow-up was pretty short. So the question was, um, how long are these responses going to last when patients get CAR-T in follicular lymphoma? Are people going to stay in remission one year, two years, three years, four years, five years? You know, we just don't know yet. And there's a fair bit of toxicity with CAR T cell therapy. So we only want to offer it to our follicular lymphoma patients if it has hope for durable remissions. And so this is just the treatment plan from the so-called Zuma 5 study, where this Axi cell product was given to patients with relapsed follicular lymphoma. And the response rates are very high in relapsed follicular lymphoma. 94% of patients responded with 79% of patients achieving complete remission. And the trial also included some patients with um, marginal zone lymphoma, and the response rate there was 83%, with 63% getting complete remission. So those results look pretty good, but the question is how durable. And so these are the progression-free survival curves, and I would say the results are looking pretty good so far. So we can see that we're out at 24 32 months here for a lot of the patients, and over half the patients are staying in remission at 24 months, about 60% with follicular lymphoma, and about 50% with marginal zone lymphoma. So, so far, so good. I still think I would like to see lo longer follow-up before I want to make pronouncements about how good this option is in follicular lymphoma, but I am excited about the possibility of CAR T-cell therapy for selected patients with relapsed follicular lymphoma. <clears throat> and then there was there is there is one more product that is worth mentioning. Um, this was a study called Alara, and this is a different CAR T product called Kesagen Leclusol. This is the CAR T product that seems to have a little less toxicity than Axi cell, and this may turn out to be a a nicer option for relapsed follicular lymphoma. Um, we have to wait for the data to mature, and this drug is not yet approved in follicular lymphoma where AxiCell is, but this was a trial done in follicular lymphoma. They enrolled 97 patients, and you can see that there's very little grade three, four CRS, and there's very little what we call neurotoxicity which is what we really fear with CAR T cell therapy. So the fact that this, this product has, seems to have less cytokine release syndrome and less neurologic toxicity makes it more attractive in follicular lymphoma. So here's the response rates for this product, 86% and 69% complete remissions. 
We think that's pretty good. And at 12 months, 67% of patients are still in remission. So that is a pretty good result and has me encouraged. I hope this product becomes available in relapse follicular lymphoma in the future. And we do know that there are some particularly high-risk patient populations, patients who relapse within two years of their frontline treatment or, or who have high, it's called metabolic tumor burden by um, PET imaging. And so these are patients where standard therapies don't work terribly well and CAR-T may turn out to be a better option. So um, I came away from the ASH meeting encouraged um, by uh, this CAR-T data um, where it looks like it should move into second-line high-risk diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and it's showing, I think it's holding up nicely and relapse follicular lymphoma, and then I'm really excited about the bispecific monoclonal antibodies in relapse follicular lymphoma. So with that, I'll stop, and I think we'll have time for questions later, and I will turn it over to our next speaker, Dr. Stevens. Thank you, Dr. Call. Um, uh, like he said, we'll take questions at the end of the program. Um, and I'm now honored to introduce Dr. Deborah Stevens. Dr. Stevens is a hematologist and oncologist at the University of Utah Huntsman Cancer Institute, where she is also an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and Hematologic Malignancies. Thank you so much, Dr. Stevens, for speaking at our program today. And I'll now turn the talk over to you. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to be here today with you all. Um, and thanks for all of you who are listening. Um, today, I'm in charge of updating you all on um, highlights for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia um, from this year's ASH meeting. And I think really the highlight, uh, I'll take just a couple of minutes to talk about the importance of clinical trials uh, but really big updates came in the term of new versions of older drugs, um, combinations of new drugs. And I will spend a little bit of time talking about CAR-T therapy, which Dr. Call so very nicely introduced for us all already. Um, just a minute about the importance of clinical trials. Um, uh, some of you may have participated. Some of you may have just heard of them before. But really, when we talk about standard of care, we mean that uh, these are drugs that have been tested in people, they're safe, and they work well. They've been approved in the United States by the organization called the FDA. So the clinical trials are really the process of testing these in people. Um, and a phase one study is really hoping to address is the drug safe. Um, however, lots of our drugs um, for patients with CLL are actually pretty effective um, in the phase one setting right now, which is very nice. Um, the phase two study, the purpose of it is how well does the drug work? So how many people respond? How long do they respond? How long do people live? And a phase three study essentially means that we're going to compare the standard of care to our new drug. And if it turns out that this drug is better than the standard of care, it becomes a standard of care. So that's um, where it leads to being approved by the FDA. So one of the themes of the ASH meeting this year was to introduce um, new versions of older drugs. Um, so most of you who have CLL probably have heard about Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and essentially the concept of, of this class of drugs is there's something called the B cell receptor pathway, pathway. And these are essentially signals that your body tells to the cancer cells to tell them to stay alive and to grow and to replicate. And that's called the B cell receptor pathway. And so I kind of think of that as the gas for the car, so the signals for the cancer. Um, and so when you block this with something called a Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, it's like you're taking the gas out of the car for the cancer. So it doesn't, can't function anymore. So it ends up dying. So um, you may have heard about drugs like ibrutinib or acalabrutinib because they are currently approved for all lines of therapy for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, I made a little table here just so you can understand. Again, I mentioned ibrutinib and acalabrutinib are currently approved. I'll be talking a little bit about a drug called zanubrutinib, which is, um, is similar to acalabrutinib, um, but not yet approved. And I'll be talking about two um, pretty exciting third-generation BTK inhibitors called pertobrutinib or nemtobrutinib. 
So the first study, it actually wasn't from ASH, but it was from a meeting earlier this year. I thought it was important to mention about the second generation um, BTK inhibitor called Zanubrutinib. It was a trial called the Alpine study, and it en enrolled patients with relapsed or refractory CLL and, and essentially compared Zanubrutinib, the new drug I mentioned, to the older drug, um, Ibrutinib. And in this study, uh, they found that uh, Zanubrutinib led to better response rates um, although it was a, a fairly minimal difference. Um, but what's most important about this study is there were less side effects. There's important side effects like atrial fibrillation and irregular heart rhythm and high blood pressure that often come along with ibrutinib, and these were significantly limited with sanibrutinib. And so what I think you need to know about this particular study is we do need longer follow-up of the study because it was a pretty short follow-up of only about a year. Um, and as I mentioned, zanubrutinib is not yet approved for CLL. However, um, there is um, some guidance in the NCCN guidelines that state you may be able to get this drug if you're having a lot of side effects on um, ibrutinib and or acalabrutinib. And so if you do have a lot of side effects from these drugs, it's worth talking with your doctor about because it is approved for a different type of cancer um, called mantle cell lymphoma, one called marginal zone lymphoma. Um, and so um, sometimes uh, your doctor might be able to get you this drug, even though it's not yet approved for CLO. A study that was uh, presented at ASH this year um, was one called the Sequoia study. And this study is for patients who have never been treated before for their CLO and they're needing their first treatment. And specifically, they did not have one of the high risk features called deletion 17P. These patients were randomized to receive the drug Zanubrutinib, which I just mentioned, um, versus bendamustine and rituximab for six cycles, um, which is um, uh, one of the standard chemotherapy um, uh, regimens that we uh, actually don't use quite as much anymore because these newer drugs um, are very effective with fewer side effects. Um, so what uh, Zanubrutinib in this study, uh, the people who received Zanubrutinib had a longer progression-free survival, meaning time without any evidence of CLL, um, and there were no newly identified side effects. Um, and so what you need to know about this study is the likely goal of it is to gain approval through the FDA for CLL, so it might be coming uh, within the next um, couple of years. Um, and again, you may be able to get this drug if you have a lot of side effects on um, ibrutinib or acalabrutinib. So, you know, it performed better than our standard chemotherapy agents, was less toxic, um, so a really great option for patients. Um, I mentioned acalabrutinib, which is um, another uh, one of the second generation brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So, um, Many of you know that lots of people get heartburn, also called reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease, and they take medications like omeprazole to block acid. So the current formulation of the drug called acalabrutinib, it actually needs stomach acid for digestion of the drug, and so you can't take acid-blocking drugs along with acalabrutinib, or if you're going to take drugs um, you know, um, drugs like Tums or other um, acid blocking drugs, you have to separate it from the drug by two hours. And so acalabrutinib is a twice daily drug. And so if you think about separating something two hours from it, you're essentially taking pills four times a day. Um, and so it, it's really inconvenient for patients. So we saw kind of the first look at the ASH meeting that um, the company who makes a calibrutinib is uh, making a new formulation that doesn't require stomach acid to digest the drug. And so if this formulation ends up getting approved, people who take a calibrutinib may be able to take these acid blocking medications safely along with it, which I think would help with um, the side effect of heartburn and, um, you know, help make the medication um, dosing a little bit more simple. So um, other things I wanted to talk about is when a, a brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor doesn't work anymore, often what happens is there's a site on CLL where the BTK inhibitor binds, um, and this site is called C481. So what happens is it's kind of like that's the keyhole. So when the drug hits the keyhole, it can um, cause the activity to start. 
However, um, what happens when it mutates is that keyhole just changes shape um, in a way that you, you know, the, the key might still fit in the hole, but you, it doesn't really fit very well. Um, and so essentially these signals are not really blocking um, the cancer growth very well. So often what I see is I see kind of a really slow progression of disease, meaning people come into clinic and I'll see people's white blood cell counts start to, you know, creep up kind of slowly, or maybe a lymph node that they knew was enlarged before they started treatment has started to get a little bit bigger. However, even though the drugs are not working, they're still you know, at least partially inhibiting um, the cancer growth. And so, you know, if you start to notice this or if your doctor says, you know, I'm not sure how well this drug is working, you know, really do not discontinue these drugs without another plan in mind. Um, because after you stop the drug, you know, the key is completely out of the hole and CLO can really progress pretty quickly. Um, so this, this mutation, we've seen it in patients who have received ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanubrutinib. And so really there needs, you know, there needed to be kind of a solution um, to what do we do um, when, when people's CLL stops responding to these um, important BTK inhibitors. So um, some of the drugs are actually uh, members of the same class. So these are third generation BTK inhibitors. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is a drug called pertubrutinib. It was formerly called Loxo305. Um, and the reason why um, this is important here is because it binds to a different site on the cancer cell. And so even if um, somebody's CLL has developed resistance to ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, this drug can still work because it binds to BTK in a different site and blocks it just as effectively. And so this study... Um, that was updated in the ASH meaning was called the Bruin study. It was for patients with relapsed and refractory CLL, um, and patients received this drug at 200 milligrams daily. Um, but this, and even though these patients' CLL had progressed through after multiple prior therapies, this drug called a, it caused a really great overall response rate of 68%. And um, if somebody who had had three prior therapies, progression-free survival was not even reached. Um, if somebody had five prior therapies, so that's a lot of prior treatments, um, this drug would work for at least a year and a half, which is a really good um, remission in patients whose CLL has become so refractory to other treatments. Um, really important that progression-free survival that we talk about, it was the same regardless of um, the mutation status of the, the BTK um, that we talked about before. And also really important, this drug had very minimal side effects. It was very well tolerated. And so um, what to know about this drug? I think this is really a drug to watch. I think it's going to be on the fast track to approval. Um, there's lots of studies going on right now that compare this to standard of care, so this phase three studies that I mentioned. Um, and there's also combinations of this drug and other um, important CLL therapies. Um, and so this is, I think, a, a really important drug to watch. Um, the next drug I want to talk about is one called nemtabrutinib. It just got the name nemtabrutinib. It used to be called ARQ531. Um, um, uh, and this is a similar concept in that it's a third generation BTK inhibitor. It doesn't bind to the same binding site. And so um, people whose CLL develops these mu resistance mutations, it was expected to be um, uh, able to treat the, um, that CLL. So in this study, it was a smaller study, um, 38 patients um, with relapsed and refractory CLL um, received this drug daily. Um, had, a, had a really great overall response rate of 58%, and the responses were seen whether the patient had a previous BTK inhibitor or not, um, and really minimal side effects. Um, this one does seem to have a few more side effects than the one I just talked about, the pertubrutinib. Um, so I'll just mention a, a few of them, including fatigue, um, constipation, um, cough, and taste disturbance um, is sometimes bothersome to my patients who I've treated with this drug. Um, but again, I think uh, what you need to know about this, it's really a drug to watch. I think it's a very promising therapy. 
And um, longer follow-up of this study is going to uh, probably give us some more information about individual patient populations, like patients who've received both a BTK inhibitor and Zenetoclax, um, or different mutation status. So um, I want to move on to the next theme that we saw um, in the ASH meeting, um, and this is combinations of new drugs. And I think this is a good time to just remind all of us um, what is venetoclax therapy, because it's commonly a drug used in these combination strategies. Um, venetoclax is, a, is another oral pill, and the concept of it is that CLL cells um, overexpress this a protein called BCL2. And the goal of that is to let the cells live on forever. However, venetoclax comes in and blocks this off and it promotes those cells to die. So it essentially, you know, takes um, what was causing it to live and eliminates it. Um, this drug venetoclax is currently approved uh, for all CLL patients um, in combination with anti-CD20. Um, I've mentioned what these anti-CD20 antibodies are over here on the right-hand side. Um, obinutuzumab and rituximab are the currently approved um, anti-CD20 um, treatments in, in four patients with CLL. Um, the obinutuzumab is a little bit newer compound, and in head-to-head -head studies, it looks to be a bit more effective than obinutuzumab. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, but really, when I talk about combinations of these new drugs, what's really happening now is we have all of these new drugs, and they're all working really well individually, but seemingly have not quite provided a cure for CLL yet. And so, um, so researchers are starting to pick two or three of these new drugs and combine them. And often that happens with the brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which we just discussed, um, BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax, and there are some newer versions coming along of that, um, and these anti-CD20s that I just mentioned. The advantages of combining them, or the hope with combining them, is that deeper, longer-lasting responses are possible or shorten treatment length. Because what I haven't focused on so far is these brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, they are meant to be taken indefinitely, meaning you take them as long as they're working. So it could be a long time. But venetoclax um, are recommended to be taken over shortened courses. And so the goal is to get people into a really deep um, remission or great responses and then be able to stop the drug and have a treatment-free period. So um, an important um, study in this um, is setting is called the CAPTIVATE study. Um, and I want to take just a minute to introduce a new term here. Um, it's called MRDU. And that means undetectable minimal residual disease. And that means you can't find any cancer cells. Um, it doesn't mean, necessarily mean they're absolutely gone. It just means that they're present at such a low level that it's such a low level we can't even detect them with our, with our um, current um, uh, laboratory tests. And so um, obviously, the less CLL, the better. Um, and so MRDU has become uh, a really desirable goal of these studies that combine the drugs. And so this CAPTIVATE study, it, it took uh, patients who had never had prior therapy for their CLL but did require therapy. Um, patients received ibrutinib um, by mouth for three months, and then they received a combination of ibrutinib plus the venetoclax therapy for 12 months. After that 15-month period of time, they had this MRD test. And if there was no MRD, patients were randomized to either go ahead and continue on ibrutinib, which is kind of the current standard what we would do, or placebo, just to see what would happen if we completely stopped the therapy. If patients had detectable MRD, patients were either randomized to continue single agent ibrutinib or continue the combination. So what's important um, updates that were shared at ASH in, in this study that um, in those who are MRD undetectable and half received ibrutinib, half received placebo, there was no difference in disease-free survival after two years, which means that those patients who received the placebo were able to successfully stop the ibrutinib for at least two years, um, hopefully eliminating some side effects. Um, but having just as good of response as patients who were continued on that indefinite ibrutinib. 
The longer follow-up, again, is going to be important, but this does give us a route to discontinue ibrutinib and make it not a permanent therapy. Um, what was important about the, the patients who did have detectable MRD, so MRD positive, it, it was noted that those people had more improvement to MRD undetectable status if you continued both of the drugs, ibrutinib and venetoclax, after that initial 15-month period. So um, what should you know about this? Um, it's not yet approved um, to be used in combination. However, there's another study that's currently ongoing um, called the GLOW study, which I think um, will uh, probably be a path to um, having approval for this in the frontline setting for CLL. Um, and it's unclear if this combination is better than other options, but there's a big study that's um, also ongoing called the CLL-17 study, and it's going to compare this regimen to several other new regimens. And so a lot going on here in the field of CLL um, with these combination therapies. The other thing to know, um, I had mentioned um, this Sequoia study um, with the drug called the Brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor called um, Zanubrutinib. And so I mentioned that this was for patients without, um, who hadn't had prior therapy, but this particular arm of the study studied people with high-risk therapy. So they had 17P disease. They combined Zanubrutinib with venetoclax. Um, and what was interesting about this study is venetoclax could be discontinued after 12 cycles if MRG was undetectable, or it could continue with for another year if it was not detectable. And then zanubrutinib, after that combination year and after 28 cycles, that drug could also be discontinued if there was no detectable MRD. And so um, some kind of creative ways here to make this a time-limited or shorter therapy. So um, really important, we saw, you know, zanubrutinib plus venetoclax caused an overall response rate of 97%, which is just outstanding. Um, and there was, uh, although the follow-up was short, only one patient had disease progression after the first 12 months on study. There were minimal side effects. Any of the common ones noted were all less experienced in less than a quarter of patients. Um, I think that this is a, a really important combination to watch, especially for patients who have deletion 17P disease um, and might uh, be coming to the clinic at some point soon. However, long fo longer follow-up of the study is needed to understand the true rate of progression-free survival. Um, this was a kind of interesting study called the CLL-13 study that we saw the very first data presented um, at um, at ASH this year, and it was a very big study um, for patients who had not previously been treated um, uh, for CLL. Um, and you can see there are lots of different options on this study. Patients either, either received kind of standard chemotherapy like FCR or BR for six cycles. They could have received venetoclax plus the antibody rituximab. They could have received venetoclax plus the newer antibody called obinutuzumab. Or they could have received triple therapy, so ibrutinib plus venetoclax plus obinutuzumab. Um, and what was important um, in the results of this study um, in venetoclax plus obinutuzumab and I, the three drug therapy, there were better rates of MRD undetectability. So about 90% of people, you couldn't detect any evidence of disease, which was great. Of course, we talked about some of those ibrutinib-related side effects of atrial fibrillation, bleeding, or infection. Those are a little bit higher, of course, in the patients who received ibrutinib. And so um, I think this is an interesting study. What was a little bit surprising about it, um, we knew that obinutuzumab was a better antibody than rituximab, but the venetoclax and rituximab arm didn't perform as well as, um, as any way as I thought it, it would. Uh, essentially, there was no difference in um, the rates of MRD undetectability between that and our old standard chemo drugs. Um, so um, what's unique about this is usually venetoclax and rituximab combination is used in relapse DLL. However, um, you know, this study, even though it was done in the frontline setting per CLL, it might entice um, doctors to use obinutuzumab instead of rituximab in that setting. 
And so, you know, venetoclax and rituximab didn't do as well as expected. And so this may affect um, the second line treatment, you know, kind of phasing rituximab out of there and, and replacing it with obinutuzumab. Um, uh, important to know the targeted therapy did have these great deep responses. Um, and there were hints during the presentation that more kind of longer term survival data would be presented um, this year at um, some of the big meetings. The other thing I, I just want to comment about, um, I've personally been involved um, uh, with this study, um, it is for looking at early treatment. Those of you with CLL know that um, if you don't have symptoms or low blood counts, you're not treated for your CLL. Um, that can be kind of scary in patients whose you know, doctor does their prognostic studies and find that they have high risk features like deletion 17P or you know, some combination of clinical and genetic risks. And so this study um, is called the S1925 Evolve study, and it looks at that combination we've talked about, obinutuzumab and venetoclax. And when patients enroll in this study, they either get early treatment, so they get treated as soon as they're enrolled in the study, or they get delayed treatment, which is uh, the current standard of care. Um, what's nice about this study is the, the medications, although expensive, are completely paid for by the study. Um, and it gives people an opportunity for, to see kind of an early treatment for their CLL, especially for these high-risk patients. It is of note, um, you must have a new diagnosis of CLL within the last year. If it's been um, longer than the last year, then um, you wouldn't qualify for this study. But again, this is the S1925 study. It's currently enrolling. So if any of you fit into that category, you know, I'd be happy to help find you a, um, a place to get enrolled in this study. It's uh, open in lots of different centers across the country. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about CAR T cell um, therapy to round out the treatment. And um, again, Dr. Call did a really great job of announcing this. This is essentially a kind of a cartoon that I drew that shows, you know, the CAR T is essentially going to recognize the target on the cancer cell and then activate the immune system um, to fight off. Um, the, the cancer, in this case, CLL. Um, and what this looks like for a patient, that your blood is collected, the T cells are separated out of it. Um, in the lab, this CAR vector, um, which tells the um, you know, compound what to go after, it's inserted into the T cells, then the T cells multiply, and then chemotherapy is given and the CAR T cells are returned to the patient. Um, you know, important side effects um, that Dr. Call already mentioned are the cytokine release and brain toxicity essentially results from an overactivation of the, um, of, uh, the immune system. One study I think is important to, um, uh, to uh, tell you guys about is the Transcend CLL study. Um, and this was actually presented at the um, IWCLL meeting last year um, in October. Um, this study enrolled um, patients with relapsed and refractory CLL, um, and they received ibrutinib plus this CAR-T product called Lysosel. Um, very impressively, the overall response rate was 100%, um, and the MRD undetectability rate was 86%. And again, this, these are in patients who have seen multiple prior therapies. Um, the, this um, grade three or higher means kind of severe side effects. We've only seen 4% um, of patients develop cytokine release, or 17% um, had these neurotoxicity. So really, um, what I think you should know about this, I think it's a really promising therapy for high-risk CLL. Um, it may be um, available as an alternative for an allogeneic stem cell transplant or one that someone else donates for, um, to you. Um, and um, I know that they're looking to try to gain approval for CLL in the next one to two years. And so, um, you know, that was kind of a whirlwind tour through the CLL um, studies that I thought were important this year. Um, you know, really focused on new versions of older drugs and combinations of new drugs with a little highlight of CAR T cell therapy. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, I'm going to stop here and we'll turn it over um, to the audience for questions and answers. 
Great. Thank you, Dr. Stevens um, and Dr. Call. Thank you both so much. Uh, we have had a lot of questions come through. Uh, we probably uh, won't get to them all, but we'll do um, as uh, best as we can. Um, if you submitted a question that uh, for some reason doesn't get answered, uh, please feel free to call our helpline after the program. They can either um, help direct you to some of our resources that might be helpful or even um, send you one of our archived uh, disease-specific webinars or um, send you information about a future webinar that might be helpful. Um, so I'd like to start off with our first question. Um, we'll direct this to Dr. Stevens. When the FDA approves a medication such as the recent approval of a calibrutinib for SLL, is there an expected time range where it might be approved by Medicare? Um, this is a good question, um, and it, it's not exactly the same for all um, for all drugs. But it's it's a fairly fast um, uptake uh, by Medicare. Once something is FDA approved, it, it's it's usually on there. Um, what's what's a little bit unique too is that we have something called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. And often, you know, for the CLL guidelines, I sit on this panel and we'll review things even before they're FDA approved. And if there's enough um, phase three supporting data, um, we'll actually put it as part of the NCCN guidelines. And if it's already a part of that, then Medicare is very likely to approve those because they look at those guidelines. And so it should be a pretty quick uptake once it's approved that it's available by Medicare. And you might even be able to get it sooner than that. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Call, this uh, question came through, I think, as you were um, going through your slides, and they asked, how do you decide to use the new treatment versus RCHOP, and is this new treatment used in relapse or refractory cases? Um, so RCHOP is a frontline treatment. It's not a treatment that we typically use for relapse refractory, so the strictly frontline use. Um, and so when I, when the, um, questioner refers to the new treatment. I'm assuming they're referring to the R chip pola regimen that I described. Um, assuming it does get FDA approval, I'm assuming the approval <clears throat> will be restricted to the patient population that was enrolled in the clinical trial, and those were patients with a, what's called an IPI risk score of two to five. So my this is a bit of a guess right now because we don't know for sure, but my my guess is most folks will opt for the r -chip pola if they have an IPI risk score of two to five in, for their patient, and then um, maybe we'll still use r -chop for IPI risk score zero to one. Again, I'm making an assumption about what the label is going to look like for r -chip pola, so um, I could be wrong about that. That's just a bit of a guess on my part. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Stevens, someone um, asked that at the time they were referring to one of the studies you were talking about, it doesn't list which one, but um, they're asking if any of them are located in the Midwest. They're in Oklahoma, and if, you know, if we're not sure about what specific um, study they're referring to, could you let them know about a good way um, that they could find this information? Yeah, um, so a really good resource is a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and if you go there and you can type in, it'll, it'll have a box to type in whatever um, cancer you're looking for. So if you're looking for CLL trials, you can type in CLL. If um, you know anything else about the study, I, I'm wondering if you might have been um, asking about the S1925 study, you can also type in S1925. Um, in there. And once you pull up the study, the, the list of studies will come up and you select the one you want, there's something in there that says locations. And so you can look to see what the closest location um, to your area is. And this is, this is applicable for all trials that are ongoing. They all have to be registered in this database. So um, it's a good way to search for what's out there. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. And just to add on to that, if you're not um, comfortable with using that uh, site or you want some additional uh, service on the matter, you can always call our helpline as well. And um, Uchenna, who works on our helpline, can help you um, locate a clinical trial as well. So that's a good resource. Um, Dr. Cole, someone uh, mentioned that although you um, 
said you had nothing substantial to report regarding T cell lymphomas. Were there any indications that research is proceeding about the possibility of using CAR T cell therapy in T cell lymphomas? There is a fair bit of research um, looking at CAR T cell strategies for T cell lymphomas. It gets tricky because now you're trying to get T cells to kill T cells and you don't want your CAR Ts to kill each other. Um, and so the whole development of CAR T for T cell lymphoma is substantially more complicated, but it is ongoing and there are a variety of strategies looking to overcome um, that issue that I just described. So I am, I'm optimistic. I don't know when it'll happen, but I, I do think we'll have CAR T for T cell lymphoma at some point. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Stevens, are there any updates on how long, um, for example, number of years unmutated CLL patients are lasting on a brutinib before relapse or if it starts to be less effective? Yeah, this is, um, this is a great question. Um, and probably the longest follow-up data we have, there was um, an eight-year um, uh, eight follow-up of the original ibrutinib studies. And what's nice about these drugs is that the patients with unmutated um, uh, CLL versus mutated CLL did very similarly um, in terms of length of progression-free survival. And if a patient was still on the drug at eight years, the majority of those patients were still in remission. Um, and so, you know, we're continuing to get longer and longer follow-up of the acalabrutinib studies as well. And so, um, you know, uh, I know sometimes when I put people on ibrutinib and they say, am I going to be on this drug forever? Um, maybe not, but, you know, if it's working really well and it's not causing any side effects, then um, I see no reason why people couldn't be on them long term. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Call, this is in regards to um, when you're talking about DLBCL, but someone asked, is there any indication of when the FDA will approve CAR-T as second-line therapy? Very good question. <clears throat> I wish I knew. Um, I am assuming it's imminent, but I don't know if it's next week, next month, May. I just can't give you um, anything specific because I have no insider knowledge on the, the, the dates of the filing and the submission packages that the companies are putting together. But I... I think the FDA has done a really good job of moving things along in a timely way over the last 10 years in oncology, and I expect them to move this forward in a timely way as well because um, it is a it's a big advance, and we you know we need to make this this strategy available to our patients um, as soon as possible. Um. Dr. Stevens, are there any new and promising treatments for small cell CLL slash NHL that has refracted or relapsed? Um, yeah, and I, you know, maybe should have um, clarified that a little bit um, with, um, I, in, in my practice at least, I essentially treat patients with SLL, small lymphocytic leukemia, um, exactly the same um, as I do with CLL. Um, and so all of the um, updates that I presented about CLL um, can also be applied to patients with SLL. Thank you for clarifying. Um, Dr. Call, um, we've had a few questions come in just about, and, and I know you mentioned um, there might have not been as much at this particular ASH, but are there any updates regarding um, promising treatments for relapse, mantle cell lymphoma, um, or, or any kind of things down the pipeline that you, you might want to mention? Sure. Um, yeah, mantle cell lymphoma, um, things that I saw this year, there's a, um, a PI3 kinase inhibitor called parsiclisib that was studied in mantle cell lymphoma, and I thought the, the data looks pretty good there, better than I'd ever seen before for a PI3 kinase inhibitor in mantle cell lymphoma. So it gave me some hope for that. 
There's a lot of ongoing work looking at BTK inhibitor combination studies in mantle cell lymphoma. And um, Dr. Stevens described BTK inhibitors um, in CLL, and so the exact same principles apply in mantle cell lymphoma. BTK inhibitors work well in mantle cell lymphoma, but they don't work as well in mantle cell as they do in CLL. So there's lots of room for improvement, and a lot of the effort is combinations, and a lot of the studies are looking at um, BTK plus venetoclax or BTK plus other classes of drugs that are active in mantle cell. <clears throat> and those trials are ongoing and getting close to maturity. So I think we'll have some good readouts in the near future on combinations. And then um, Dr. Stevens had mentioned that third generation BTK, BTK inhibitor pertubrutinib and the pertubrutinib data in mantle cell is also looking very promising. Um, and pertubrutinib is now being studied and compared head to head against first and second generation BTK inhibitors. So there's, there's plenty happening in mantle cell lymphoma. Just the timing wasn't quite right where we, we got a lot of new information at this year's meeting, but I think more information is, is coming, you know, soon. Great. Thank you, Dr. Call. Um, Dr. Stevens, can you speak to why or what mechanism affects obinutuzumab to a better efficacy in CLL than rituximab? Yeah, sure. Um, so there, um, all of the, the antibody therapies, they have really kind of four main known mechanisms of action. Um, one of them is more direct cell killing. One of them is activating something called the complement cascade um, uh, as part of the immune system. And the other two major are, are, um, are essentially exciting other immune cells to help kill the CLL. And one that I think is particularly effective um, for obinutuzumab is, um, is one where the, the antibody actually stimulates these other immune cells called NK cells to kill the CLL cells. And that activity is quite high in obinutuzumab and it's significantly higher um, than it is um, with rituximab. And so I think, you know, just based on the fact that CLL patients' immune system is not quite, um, you know, not quite working effectively, bringing this antibody in to stimulate those NK cells to kill the CLL cells is very effective. And so if I had to pick one, you know, there, there's multiple reasons, but I would say that's the biggest reason is because of its ability to stimulate other immune cells to attack the CLL. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Cole, what are your thoughts on the CI3K inhibitor standalicid for treatment in relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma? Um, so there are a number of PI3 kinase inhibitors that have been approved in for relapsed follicular lymphoma, including idelalisib and copanlisib and umbralisib. And there are some others in development, one of which is zandalisib. The data I've seen so far for zandalisib looks um, impressive, and um, I think I think it'll get an approval in follicular lymphoma when, this, when the studies are mature and read out. Um, you know, it's not being compared head-to-head -head against the other PI3 kinase inhibitors, so it's hard to know if it's a better PI3 kinase inhibitor than what we currently have. Um, it might be. I can't tell yet. So I think Zandalisib looks very good. I think it will get an approval. How much better it is than what we already have, I'm not sure yet. Um, Dr. Stevens, is the MRD test only for CLL patients, or is that also for follicular lymphoma? Uh, well, this is a, a really great question because um, right at the current moment, there is an FDA-approved MRD test for CLL, but there isn't one for follicular lymphoma. Um, the tests for each subtype of lymphoma are going to be just a, a little bit different um, because you're looking at different targets and depending on how you're assessing minimal residual disease. Um, but there's a lot of, of research that's ongoing about minimal residual disease or even um, the number of 
circulating tumor cells in follicular lymphoma, but for follicular lymphoma, it's not approved um, to, um, to do in clinic as of yet. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Call, uh, we had a few patients ask if there were any Waldenstrom um, specific updates from the ASH conference this year. Um, let's see. Well, before the ASH meeting, we did get the approval of Xanabrutinib and Waldenstrom's, which I thought was great news. Um, as Dr. Stevens pointed out, Xanabrutinib was compared head to head to Ibrutinib and CLL, and looks like it works just as well and, and looks like it has a better safety profile. And so, um, and we had seen some data comparing Xanabrutinib to Ibrutinib and Waldenstrom's earlier, and it was really the same story, worked just as well with a better safety profile. So I'm Happy to have Xanabrutinib as an option for Waldenstrom's. And then um, I saw some data on another novel BTK inhibitor, um, Orelabrutinib in Waldenstrom's, um, which showed nice high response rates and good durability. So, you know, there are other agents that are being developed in Waldenstrom's that could make an impact. And like I mentioned with mantle cell, there are ongoing combination studies like BTK inhibitor plus venetoclax in Waldenstrom's, and those could turn out to be fantastic options, and it may afford the ability to give these treatments in a time-limited way. So um, I think we just are waiting for that data to mature and read out um, um, before we know for sure how best to use the combination therapies. Okay, thank you. Um... Just uh, as a follow-up on the MRD conversation, Dr. Stevens, someone uh, just asked, what does an MRD test result of rare to absent mean? Um, this is a good question. It may be a little bit difficult to answer without, uh, without seeing it. Um, however, you know, the, the fewer, like I said, it's minimal residual disease undetectable. It doesn't necessarily mean negative. And so some of these tests will pick up just a very small amount of these cells. And, and maybe that's the rare um, designation that you're seeing on um, the MRD testing. Um, essentially, that would mean that um, there are just very, very minimal cells, um, but it's still detectable. You. Um, Dr. Call, after the meeting, are you more or less convinced that allogeneic CAR T will replace autologous? I don't think I saw anything at the meeting that would make me think allogeneic CARs are about to replace autologous CARs. Mm -hmm. um, it's a complicated process to make CAR T cell therapies and um, the so-called off-the-shelf allo cars have certain challenges in their design. Um, the, they'll need to conduct some large trials with these allogeneic cars proving that they're as effective as what we already have and that they're safe. So to me, those things seem several years away at this point. Um, I don't see it happening imminently. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stevens, uh, if a brutinib causes AFib, is beta blocker therapy effective or is more needed? Um, this is a great question. Um, and just because uh, we know that atrial fibrillation, um, this irregular heart rhythm is very common in patients with, um, who are treated with uh, ibrutinib. And very often, patients are able to achieve good control with a, a beta blocker, um, and these are drugs like metoprolol. Um, however, there are a lot of drug interactions with um, ibrutinib and some of the other cardiac medications like digoxin or, you know, some of the calcium channel blockers um, like nifedipine. Um, and so, 
um, you really want to work closely with your cardiologist and oncologist and make sure there's a pharmacist reviewing your medications. Um, you know, the other tricky thing um, is that um, atrial fibrillation comes along with a risk of stroke, and so often people are on blood thinners, and ibrutinib actually also increases your risk of bleeding. So adding a blood thinner to ibrutinib just ups the risk of, you know, more severe bruising or bleeding. And so, you know, this is a, a case where I often would switch over to acalabrutinib just because it has a lower risk of atrial fibrillation um, and patients can maintain control. However, if, you know, you're on ibrutinib, you're on a beta blocker, the rate is controlled, you're not having issues with bleeding or bruising, then I think it's perfectly fine to stay on that combination of medications. And so I think it just requires a little bit of complicated management between your cardiologist and your, um, your oncologist. So just make sure you have a good team there to help you out. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Kaufman had a question about Hodgkin lymphoma um, and just clarifying treatment. They asked, am I wrong when I believe that CAR T for Hodgkin lymphoma is still not that promising. Would you still advise an allogeneic cell, stem cell transplant above CAR T for refractory HL patients that had all other treatments before? Well, that is a very complicated question um, and hard to give a really precise answer, I'm afraid. Um, certainly, allogeneic stem cell transplantation is a proven strategy in refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, meaning that for some patients, it can get them back into remission durably. Of course, allotransplant brings along with it the risk of chronic graft-versus-host disease, which can be very debilitating. So um, for those of us who treat these patients, we would love it if a CAR-T product came along because that wouldn't have those same long-term risks of chronic graft-versus-host disease. We just aren't there yet. There are CAR-Ts being studied for Hodgkin, and if a patient found one as part of an ongoing clinical trial, it would be perfectly appropriate to consider that as one of the options along with allogenic stem cell transplantation. But I think which of those to choose would really depend on the patient and their situation and I couldn't. I can't give you generic advice about which strategy to choose without, you know, meeting that patient and sitting down with them and going over the pros and cons of each strategy. Great, thank you, Dr. Cole. Um, Dr. Stevens, um, a CLL patient just asked. Um, they said they have a particular interest in autoimmune hemolytic anemia and wanted um, to know if there are any updates that uh, you had regarding specifically to that um, or information from ASH. Um, uh, good question. There were no, you know, CLL specific updates on autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, that's a, a condition when your immune system thinks your red blood cells are like bacteria or something that your body should be rid of. And so your immune system essentially attacks your red blood cells that causes anemia and it can be quite refractory um, to different treatments. Um, you know, the only thing I, you know, there were no specific um, updates at ASH this year. However, um, you know, usually, you know, the best way to um, to target this is effective control of the CLL. Um, you know, if you're having difficulties, um, you know, that it's um, not responsive to other prior therapies, sometimes, you know, full and effective treatment of the CLL is the best way to get rid of it. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we'll end um, uh, for both of you if you have any updates, but um, a couple people have asked um, very popular question, but uh, we're, they're also just curious if anything came up at ASH in regards to um, any studies uh, of lymphoma, lymphoma around COVID-19 and, and treatment, just in case um, either of you have any comments about that. Yeah, I can, um, I can comment. There was um, a, a couple of studies about uh, patients who have CLL and their response um, to the vaccines um, at ASH this year. And, you know, the, the, the problem with um, those studies is that the easiest way to de for us to detect response is um, to detect if you have any antibodies. And antibodies is actually only one, um, 
you know, only one part of the of people's immune response to COVID. And so even if you don't have antibody response, there were um, a little bit of data that an additional quarter of people actually had some T cell response, which is not a test that we can just do in standard practice. And so it does look like even if you don't have antibodies um, and, you know, probably about half of the patients uh, vaccinated with CLL, um, only about half of patients do develop antibodies, there are an additional percentage that likely have some protection. Now, um, I think I saw that there was a question also about Evusheld, which I'm, I'm very excited about. It just became available. It's a preventive antibody. Um, and so it kind of does what the vaccine is trying to do. So the vaccine, you put something in and it's trying to stimulate your immune system to make an antibody. It just directly puts the antibody in. Um, this is um, at least in the clinical trial that they uh, presented their data, it showed it was about 83% effective at preventing symptomatic COVID. Now, the problem is it got emergency access uh, approval, but it's very, very limited availability. So there's lots of people who um, fit this description that need it, um, you know, people who can't form uh, good responses to the vaccine or people who are getting active therapy for lymphoma or chronic lymphocytic leukemia all should qualify for it, but it's very limited supply. So I would say, you know, get in, talk, uh, get in touch with your doctor's office and they can let you know when it might be available in your area. Great. Um, well, thank you both so much for those updates. Um, I'll end with a comment here, um, not a question that someone left, but they said it's always inspiring to hear about the research and hard work that is being performed behind the scenes to make treatments more effective and manageable. Thank you for all the amazing work you are doing to help patients. You are all lymphoma superheroes. So those are the specific thank you um, to both of you and everyone else working in the field. So we really appreciate you taking the time uh, today to join us. Uh, you're welcome, and thank you for the nice compliment. Yeah, thank you, and very happy to be here. Great. Um, so thank you, everyone, again. And a reminder, if you have any additional questions or you'd like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma, you can reach out to the LRF helpline at 800-500-9976. Um, this Recording, this will be recorded and sent out to your email in the next couple of days. So if you missed something um, or you wanted to listen again um, to one of the doctors about any of the studies, uh, you'll get that in your email shortly. And at the conclusion of this program, you'll also receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. We ask that you please take a few moments to complete this as they're very important for us to ensure that we deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and to have a wonderful day.